<laughs> okay. Uh, hello and welcome. Um, my name is Natalie Stetson. I am the director of the Erie Canal Museum. I am so glad that you are all here today. I think we've got just about everybody who's registered is here. Um, I'm happy to introduce uh, our curator, Ashley Moretti, who uh, will be leading us today. And I am sad to announce that this is Ashley's last program with us as curator of the Erie Canal Museum. She has accepted another position. She's going to be the executive director of the St. Lawrence County Historical Association. So she is with us now for only about a week and a half more. And then she is off on a new adventure. So we're very excited for her, but we are somewhat sad for us. Um, but she's not going too far. She won't be a stranger, um, but we are uh, excited to have her uh, today and to present this program for us. Um, so with that, oh, let's see, I actually, I almost forgot, Ashley, I've got a couple commercials to do because of course I have some commercials to do. Um, so we have some exciting programs coming up. Um, you should all definitely check our website and our Facebook page for those programs. I will put links in the chat box for those. Um, we have a, a, an escape room like event called Escape on the Erie where you and your team uh, attempt to open a breakout box um, and, and <laughs> save the world. No, save, uh, you, you are a German immigrant on the canal and, and are in, in Syracuse who came via the canal and, and uh, uh, work to, to solve some answers. I'm sorry, letting people, Ashley, you're right, letting people in at the same time as trying to talk is just, it's, it's very difficult. Um, but we, we want to make sure that everybody gets in. Uh, so that event is coming up, Escape on the Erie. Um, and that's $25 for a team of up to six people. And that's a live in-person at the museum event. Um, we have it spaced out. So only uh, a couple of teams will be in the museum at a time so that everybody can maintain proper social distancing. Um, and I should be able to tell you the date of that right off the top of my head. And you'd think I have it right here in front of me, but I don't. So it is in October. Um, I will tell you the date very momentarily. Maybe Derek, Derek can't unmute himself to to tell us. <laughs> type it in the chat box, though. The 23rd. Thanks, Derek. You're a champ. <laughs> October 23rd. I actually, I knew that because it was on September 23rd, and it's also on October 23rd. Oh. Um, we offered it in September. Um, it was a great event. We, we Derek, Derek learned a couple of things, uh, has made a couple of adjustments to it, and, and so it should be should be a really fun event. We also have added more offerings of our um, Pathway of Resistance tour, which explores the African American experience in the Erie Canal Corridor. Um, it is kind of a tough story to share. Um, there, it does not have much shiny happy endings, um, but we have had three sold out tours so far. So we have added three more um, of those tours in the month of October. They are, I want to say the 13th, 15th, and 24th, but I'm going to tell you accurately, they are, no, I was wrong. It's a good thing. I, uh, it's the 12th, 15th, and 24th. Um, Derek has, has have done lots of research and, and again, led three sold out tours. So we're very, very excited to offer three more of those. And that again is an in-person event um, outdoors. So make sure you wear walking shoes and a jacket if you need one. Um, so with that, with those, with those commercials, I will now hand things over to um, our, our curator, um, who's going to answer some frequently asked questions. Ashley, take it away. Yum. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, let's see here. There we go. All right. So welcome to the Erie Canal Museum, virtually. It's kind of a bummer to me that I got to do my, my last curator talk here over Zoom because I really loved having them in person and getting to have people come and come and, and crowd around in our, our second floor gallery up here, but that's okay. So today I'm here via Zoom in the museum's research library, and I'm here in hopes of answering some Erie Canal Museum frequently asked questions. I devised the idea for this talk after a conversation that I had with uh, Mike DiBello, who I know is, is on the call here. Uh, we had a conversation about some of the, the questions that come up frequently um, with our visitors and it got me to thinking kind of what are the parts of the Erie Canal story that we're not really telling the whole story on? What do we need to fill some gaps on? 
And so I'm here today with four questions to answer in hopes of shedding additional light on the Erie Canal story. I got these questions from my inbox, from fellow staff members, and from conversations with our volunteers. So thank you for joining me, and I hope you learned some new information about New York's canals today. <laughs> this is perhaps the most common question that we get at the front desk, and I kind of understand, you know, because the museum is located in downtown Syracuse, where there is currently no Erie Canal. Um, I've heard it more times than I can count while working at our front desk and talking to visitors. Our executive director, Natalie, likes to say that we are the only maritime museum without water. We are officially part of CAM, the Council of American Maritime Museums. What I always want to say to people when they go, does the Erie Canal still exist, is, of course, of course the Erie Canal still exists. Uh, Erie Boulevard, right outside the museum, used to be the original and enlarged Erie Canal. And at, uh, nearby Oswego Boulevard used to be the original and enlarged Oswego Canal which originated in Syracuse and ran up to Lake Ontario. So both of these canals actually still exist. They just don't run through Syracuse anymore. And a lot of visitors to the museum are really kind of confused by this. So when a visitor does come into the museum and asks that question, is there still an Erie Canal? Where is it? The first thing I do is take them around the corner to uh, the large map that's in our first floor permanent exhibit, the Erie Canal Made in New York. Uh, this map shows a comparison of the current canal system and the 19th century canal system, and it's, it's very immediately evident. As you can see in the photo, there's, there's just two buttons that you push, and it, it explains so much more than me giving a sermon ever could. A lot of visitors to the museum are also really interested in kind of this canal comparison shopping, which I think is pretty cool also. Um, they ask about where the best place to, places to see old and new canal are. Since we're in the 19th century canal's middle division, it's really easy to send people to sites like Camillus, which has this restored section of enlarged Erie Canal, and they also have this aqueduct here over Nine Mile Creek. This aqueduct dates to 1845 and restore, was restored several years ago. So we also recommend that people go and check out uh, Lock 24 in Baldwinsville. Lock 24 was actually the first lock on the, the Barge Canal to open, and it is the closest contemporary lock to Syracuse. And uh, in, in normal non-pandemic times, it's pretty well traveled. So if you're hanging out out there, it's, it's pretty common to see boats going through. So I usually give a little overview of New York's canal history when I do these curator talks, but for the sake of brevity, it's gonna be a very abbreviated one today. Uh, the original Erie Canal was of course constructed from 1817 to 1825 with the construction beginning in Rome, New York in the middle. It spanned 363 miles across the state, originating at the Hudson River in Albany and ending at, at Lake Erie in Buffalo. It was four feet deep and 40 feet across with 83 locks designed to overcome 570 feet of elevation change across the state and it had 18 aqueducts and over 300 bridges. So shortly after this canal opened, it was already too small to maintain the level of traffic that it attracted, and so it was enlarged in a series of projects that ran from the 1830s to the 1860s. This took the canal to seven feet deep and 70 feet across, and they removed 11 locks in the process, they straightened it out a little bit, which gave it a total of 72 locks. And a lot of other canals were built to connect to the Erie, such as the aforementioned Oswego Canal, the Black River Canal, the Shenango Canal. These are just a few of them. You can see they're, they're mapped out on this map. Um, other improvements were made along the way, including the ill-fated uh, $9 million improvement at the, end of the 20, at the end of the 19th century. But uh, we do consider these, two, these to be the first two iterations of the Erie Canal. And the system lasted until the early 20th century. So currently, New York State is on its third system of canals. And this one is based on the natural waterways across New York State. The current system is popularly known as the Barge Canal, but it's more formally known as the New York State Canal System. I refer to it by both names. A lot of people who are New Yorkers, you know, by birth just call it the Barge Canal. Um, try to stay with me. I know that's confusing too, I'm sure. So this consists of four separate canal branches that cover a lot of New York State. There's the main Erie Canal branch, which follows a similar path to the original, east to west. Uh, the Oswego Canal, which now runs from three rivers, north of the city of Syracuse, up to Lake Ontario. The Champlain Canal, which includes Lake Champlain in the northeastern part of the state, and then the Cayuga Seneca Canal, which includes Cayuga and Seneca Lakes. There are 524 miles in total and 57 locks, and this new, the new system has a minimum depth of 12 feet, and the width is 120 feet. Now, this really only comes into play out in the western part of the Erie Canal because some of the canal in western New York is still man-made because there just aren't natural waterways out that way that are suitable to, to be a canal. So. While there are fewer individual canals in New York than there used to be, because a lot of the small 19th century feeders and lateral branches have been closed. And now you can see a lot of these on this map, which is from 1854. 
A lot of these canals were kind of failed experiments and they only operated for a short time. They were sort of this, this canal mania that kind of swept through, through the state and, and through the country at this time. Um, they were an opportunity for New York towns and villages to get in on the canal craze, but a lot of them operated at a loss because there were construction issues, maintenance issues. In some cases, they helped to create local businesses in these areas, but they were not worth maintaining past the early 20th century. So when I say that the current canal system is based on natural waterways, this is also a point of confusion for a lot of our visitors. Uh, we know that a canal, by its very definition, is a, an artificial waterway. So I do wonder what some visitors think when they hear me talking about the Mohawk River being the Erie Canal. Um, it is true though. Existing natural waterways in New York State were canalized in order to create the New York State Canal System. A couple different types of dredge machinery was used to ensure that lakes and rivers had a minimum of 12 feet of depth to allow for boat navigation. They were used to remove sand and gravel from lake and river bottoms and to keep lock gates clear for operation as well. And speaking of locks, these were added to rivers to allow boats to traverse the elevation changes across the state because the canal may have changed, but New York still has those pesky elevation changes. These locks are a lot larger than those on the enlarged Erie Canal of the mid 19th century. Um, those locks were 90 feet long by 15 feet wide and they were operated by hand using balance beams. The locks on the current system, however, are 328 feet long by 45 feet wide and they're operated with electric motors. And regarding the Mohawk River specifically, movable dams were also added to it to mitigate flooding that occurs during high water times. The Mohawk River Valley is an area of the state that was made especially prosperous by the 19th century canal. And when the 20th century canal was built, the engineers hoped to avoid the devastation of those areas and resulting financial losses from flooding. Also, there was the possibility that New York State could have had to pay reimbursement if somebody's business was damaged from flooding. So it was in their best interest to try and mitigate this. Um, this isn't a great photo, but it's, it's a good photo, if that makes sense. This is uh, Lock 8, the Scotia Dam. So another confusing part of this history to museum visitors is the dearth of commercial traffic on the current canal system. In the first few decades of operation, the Barge Canal saw a lot of commercial usage, uh, particularly by shippers of grain, building materials, automobiles, and um, crude sulfur as well. And then by the mid 20th century, oil was the most common product shipped on the canal. 79% of canal shipping in the year 1950 was oil. The standard oil company's motor ships, they actually fit in the locks and they would send oil from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean via the canal. In the 1960s, this commercial traffic eased off and oil was sent via pipeline rather than by boats and pleasure traffic became a lot more common on the canal. Other means of transportation for business took over. There were highways built, more railroads, and even bigger waterways like the St. Lawrence Seaway, which opened in 1959. So today, the New York State Canal System remains largely a site of recreation across the state, but commercial traffic was on the rise during the 2010s. The canal is still often the best way uh, to ship huge items like electric transformers, massive construction equipment. In 2020, the canal system did not open for navigation as planned on May 15th, as has been the case for the last several years because of the pandemic. Instead, parts of the system opened on July 4th or even later and with reduced hours for lock operation. The system is scheduled to close to navigation effective 5 o'clock p.m. on October 14th, so that is next week. This is earlier than usual in an attempt to address projects that didn't get worked on because of the pandemic. It's really a shame that New York's historic water, man-made waterways were negatively impacted by this year's crisis, but it's really not all that surprising since everything was, including the museum. The canal relies a lot on tourism, and I hope that things will be better during the next canaling season. So as you can see, the Erie Canal is not just a relic of the past, it is a current waterway and should remain so into the future. So now that we've cleared up that little mystery, let's move on to question two. <laughs> this is the question that I get personally more than any other question. This is one that gets sent to my e email inbox. This is one that people call about. Visitors, when I'm talking to visitors, visitors often ask this. Um, more specifically, do you have a list of people who built the Erie Canal? A lot of people think that there, there must be a database somewhere, you know, that you can just type in somebody's great, great grandfather's name and, and see, you know, oh yeah, you know, he, he built the canal, here's his name right here. Unfortunately, this database doesn't exist. Um, that level of record most often wasn't kept. And on the off chance that records like that were kept, we, we don't have them at the Erie Canal Museum. You gotta remember in the early 19th century, there was no OSHA, there was no social security administration. 
employees working for contractors on parts of the canal didn't have to show ID. They didn't have to fill out a W-4 form to, to get taxes taken out. That wasn't a thing. Um, while we don't have names, what we do have are details about the lives of these workers, you know, how they worked and where they lived and what they ate and what kind of existence they had. I think this is a fascinating story and I'd like to talk to you about it. The Erie Canal is often referred to as America's first school of engineering due to the fact that engineering as a profession in North America grew from the canal project. The men who became the engineers on the Erie Canal project, they actually traveled to Europe to study canals in Europe. But a project with this particular scale and scope had never been attempted before. Native talent was incredibly important to this project. The canal was completed in sections with work beginning July 4th, 1817 at Rome. And as sections were finished, they would be watered and open to boat traffic. Canal construction required a huge labor force. The labor market was underdeveloped and the size of the project necessitated a lot of workers. Digging and the construction work itself was contracted out to uh, private contractors who would use their own tools and they would hire their own labor. The canal commission would give contracts for lengths of canal as little as a quarter mile, which meant that even men of moderate means could, could get in on this canal project and make some money. There were over 50 contractors just for the first 58 mile section that was completed and new ones constantly applied. Most of them profited and they ended up applying for another contract after they finished their first one. This image on here is a scan of a receipt book that was kept by a contractor named William Jerome as he worked on the Oswego Canal in the late 1820s. The canal commissioners were nativist as a lot of Americans were in the 19th century and still are. Um, they bragged in 1819 that three quarters of contractors were quote, born among us, meaning native farmers, mechanics, merchants, and professional men who lived near the construction area. The Erie Canal was constructed at a time when the economic landscape of America was changing. At the time of construction, there was less and less land available for personal agricultural production due to the increasing needs of commercial farming. So canal work became an attractive prospect for a lot of laborers. It offered relatively high cash wages, about 50 cents a day, and it was seasonal. Local farmers had the skills necessary to, to be canal laborers digging, uh, cutting down of trees, pulling stumps, driving teams of animals. Some also knew blacksmithing, carpentry, stonework. These, these were all skills that came in handy. The overwhelming stereotype of canal workers is that they were Irish. I get asked about this all the time. This might be the second most common question or comment that I get. Oh, the Erie Canal was built by the Irish. It is true that some of the workers were Irish and as time went on, more and more of them were Irish, um, but they didn't come to New York specifically to dig a canal here. A lot of the labor force that was in Western New York had immigrated before the canal period. You gotta remember the Irish potato blight and the resulting famine was from 1845 to 1849. And at that time, over a million Irish immigrants would come to the United States. This was right during the canal's enlargement period. So those huge numbers of Irish workers weren't necessarily here for the original canal digging, but they were here for the enlargement projects. There's a big difference between those people that were recruited for skilled work versus those recruited for unskilled work. The skilled workers were more often native born or they were here from Germany or England or Scotland. The unskilled laborers overwhelmingly were Irish. Workers who immigrated from Germany, England and Scotland often came with their families and uh, they would settle in the area, you know, build a house, stay here, uh, versus Irish immigrants were usually young single men and they became sort of this mobile workforce. They would seek ongoing work on canal construction and lateral projects as time went on. Another uh, question that I get asked in, in this regard is, did slaves build the canal? African-American slaves almost certainly did work on construction of the canal, but there just isn't much data on their numbers and, and the kind of work that they did. The largest population of slaves in New York was actually centered down around New York City. So they weren't really geographically in the area for working on the Erie Canal. Um, some of the local landowners who were given contracts to, to work on the canal were slave owners. But if they used their own slaves along with hired labor, they didn't really keep track of that. Sometimes convict labor was used, and um, this was kind of controversial. Um, there, there, there was a lot of fear in some of the communities that had convict labor, like Rochester in 1822. It was a big scandal that convicts were working on the Erie Canal in Rochester. These are some of my favorite items from the museum's collection. Um, they're, they're wooden canal workers, and as you can see, they're in various stages of, of uh, completion. The artist that was working on them actually, actually passed away while he was working on them. Um, as time went on, newspaper ads were the, the means of recruitment of workers to work on the canal. 
The ads often asked for a lot more laborers than would have actually been needed with the intention to flood the labor market and drive wages down. Professional, professional canalers knew not to trust these ads because they, they described the work as being too good to be true. They often had their own network for information about employment prospects. You know, this photo here, of course, there, there was no photography at the time of original canal construction and photography didn't become widespread until after the enlargement period. So this is a photo of canal work from the early 20th century in Seneca Falls. Uh, canal work necessitated movement and motion. Workers were always on the move. They often traveled in groups. They would follow a favored contractor or, you know, if their buddies were going to go work on a section in another part of the state, yeah, you know, I'll go, go join Bill and we'll work over here now. Work would end in one place and then it would open up again in another. Um, it was very itinerant work and uh, there are other reasons for this such as conflict with bosses or the difficulty of the work. Um, dismissal for various reasons, seasonal interruptions, financial interruptions. When work would stop due to winter and seasonal changes, pretty much the entire workforce would be laid off. This was especially the case during the winter. Laborers would stay nearby and try to find odd jobs or maybe get some work in labor camps that were nearby. Some would go to the nearest city to look for work or, or to get charity. There was competition for workers from other industries, including farming, handicraft production, manufacturing, and building. The work itself was hard. Uh, it was called rough labor. This involved the use of animals such as oxen and horses and mules and hand tools. Some construction innovations were developed as a result of the canal projects, such as the stump puller that you can see in the slide. The canal went through wooded areas and the removal of tree stumps needed was expensive. Uh, the canal had to overcome geographical changes while maintaining a manageable descendant altitude. Um, plus reservoirs, locks, aqueducts, all of these things had to be built. This was industrial work by way of animals, axes, picks, shovels, carts, and wheelbarrows. And consequently, the life of a canaler was hard and dangerous. The contractor would often supply food and shelter and clothing in order to help maintain that workforce, but also to create dependence, you know, this notion of the company store. Room and board would form a significant part of the canal workers' earnings, and shanties and cabins would be constructed for shelter and other goods and services provided in the area. There were also jobs for women in these camps. Um, a cook, who was often a woman, would prepare food, and a laundress might wash clothes. Women could sell goods locally. It could also can be assumed that some of them worked as prostitutes as well. The support of women in the labor camps was very important, and of course, the construction of the canal led to additional roles for women in canal communities later on. They worked in canal side businesses, shops, farms, factories, and those catering to canalers, and they also worked on boats. Women also soon began to take on a large role in the social changes happening within the state. Uh, abolition, temperance, women's suffrage, all of these were movements that were, were guided by women. Sometimes the work accommodations for canal laborers consisted of a family dwelling with a husband, wife, and children living alongside boarders that came to work on the canal. And this sort of arrangement became more common after the initial construction period and during the enlargement projects. Company housing by this point had, had become kind of rare. In this way, the canal co-opted family life and affected the movement and economic trajectory of families. This communal way of life was definitely of more benefit to single men than it was to men with families. They had no family to support, their needs were met, they could do whatever they wanted with the cash part of their earnings. Men with families, however, were generally not paid enough to support all their needs, and so canal work became a family affair. And you'd have wives and children also working on the canal to bring in money. The accommodations themselves were not high class. Descriptions of the settlements as dirty and disorderly come from travelers passing through work areas rather than the workers themselves. So there's, there's definitely some bias there. It is doubtful that the camps were the model of fine living. However, they would have been crowded and unsanitary for sure. There were two different settlement patterns. There was the urban shanty town and work camps on the canal itself. And whatever you had, there was often violence and sometimes even ethnic conflicts within the workspaces. Uh, sometimes the shanty towns would go on to become permanent neighborhoods. Uh, or even towns. For example, Irish Row became the town of Lockport. So the workday was long, could be 12 to 14 hours in the summer and eight to 10 in the winter if work was being done in the winter. A cook's helper would blow a wake up horn a half hour before sunrise to signal time for breakfast. During the day, there would be breaks for lunch, dinner and liquor, which was also part of their room and board. Uh, it sounds kind of shocking to us now, but this sort of outdoor labor that was being done was believed to necessitate the consumption of alcohol during the workday. You know, yeah, you're going to dig a canal. Here, you're, 
we're, we're going to give you, give you whiskey too. Um, breakfast and dinner were usually eaten at the camp with lunch at the work site. Sometimes it was a cold lunch, sometimes it would be cooked and just brought over to the men. This is also an item in the museum's collection, although it is actually visiting the State Museum in Albany right now. It's, it's been on exhibit out there. Uh, this is a brass kettle from 1820 that was actually used to cook in canal labor camps. Ample amounts of firewood and clean water were required for cooking tasks, so this involved even more work for laborers in the camp. What kind of food did they eat? Uh, the canal workers were fed really well, actually. Uh, construction work required it. Again, this is heavy physical labor. You know, you have to be eating enough calories to maintain yourself based on what you're expending. Uh, some of the staple foods that they were fed included flour, beef, bacon, potatoes, beans, and wild game. The actual cooking was often very rudimentary. Um, the creation of stews would, would be, they would just layer meat and potatoes in, in a kettle, you know, in water over an open fire, and just boil until cooked and then and then served. You know, it wasn't really fine cuisine, but it was hearty enough to sustain the high level of physical work that was being performed. This is a woodcut image of the deep cut at Lockport. Canal work was rife with occupational hazards, as I'm sure you can imagine. The canal was a breeding ground and a highway for infectious disease. Typhoid fever, dysentery, and cholera all spread like wildfire, especially in the close quarters of the work camp. Mosquitoes plagued the work sites, and they spread malaria and yellow fever. Those working in the camps in the role of cook or support workers would have risked illness as well. These, these were contagious illnesses. Injuries were always a risk for the workers from the minor to the very serious or even deadly. Working in the elements, heat stroke, frostbite, yeah, depending on the time of year, these were a risk. Uh, blasting operations were especially dangerous, especially with inexperienced workers, sometimes even kids. Drowning was a risk, um, remember, there's no OSHA, there's no social safety net, and there's no real compensation if you happen to injure yourself. Although a lot of the con contractors realized that it was in their best interest to kind of maintain morale with their workers and an adequate workforce, and they would sometimes provide a small pension for injured workers. Canal construction and support work did not make for an easy life, and after the work was finished, some workers moved into related professions, such as working on canal boats, they'd go into mining or railroads, all of these were benefited by the creation of the canals. Some former canal builders moved to cities, which had sprung up along the canals and began an urban existence, in line with the American Industrial Revolution taking place at the time. So I hope this section has been informative for you, even if I likely can't confirm that your great-great-great-grandfather worked on the digging of the original Erie Canal. So now we can move on to question three. <laughs> A lot of museum visitors are interested in the mechanics of running the Erie Canal and specifically waylocks and uh, their weighing and tolling process. The matter of the scale in particular is of interest to visitors, and of course the Erie Canal Museum's home is the Syracuse Waylock Building, which is my favorite building in Syracuse. I will definitely acknowledge my bias here, and I'm really happy to get one last chance to talk about our building. <laughs> so the Syracuse Waylock is the only one of seven left from the 19th century canal. The other six were located in Oswego, Utica, West Troy, Albany, Waterford, and Rochester, as you can see here, which is gone but not forgotten. These were all torn down in the early part of the 20th century, and ours in Syracuse was set to follow suit, if not for the actions of some concerned citizens. The Syracuse Waylock was to be demolished for the construction of Interstate 81 right through the city. Instead, the building was placed on the National Register of Historic Places and officially opened as the Erie Canal Museum in October of 1962. It's owned by Onondaga County now. So what was the purpose of this building before the mid 20th century, and how did it work? So I have to give special thanks here to Craig Williams of the Canal Society of New York State, uh, formerly of the New York State Archives and formerly of the Erie Canal Museum. Craig is a noted authority on the history and operation of the Syracuse Waylock and he wrote his master's degree thesis about it. The current, Sy the current Syracuse Waylock was the fourth such building in Syracuse and it was constructed in 1850. Toll collection on the original and enlarged canals was of paramount importance to fund the operation of the canal and pay off the money granted by the New York State Legislature for the project. The previous three waylocks in Syracuse were just north of a bridge on what is today James Street, and the fourth waylock was situated along the Erie Canal itself at the junction with the Oswego Canal, which had opened in 1828. Syracuse was one of the first canal towns to get a waylock, with the first one opening here in 1824. And I remember the whole canal in full didn't actually open until towards the end of 1825. So we, we got our waylock early. Uh, so these first waylocks operated using the principle of displacement to weigh the boats and charge toll. The first waylock here had a chamber large enough to hold a canal boat. 
The chamber was 85 feet long, 15 feet wide, and four feet deep. The chamber had wooden gates that closed it off from the rest of the canal once a boat was inside. When a boat was in it, the water's depth was measured using a metallic rod that was marked with feet, tenths, and hundredths of a foot. From this measurement, the volume displaced by the boat was calculated. The water would then be emptied from the chamber into a receptacle below, and the boat would rest on timbers to support its weight. Uh, this receptacle was 30 feet long, 25 feet wide, and 5 feet deep, and the metallic rod would be used, yet again, to determine the uh, water volume left by the boat. The toll collector would, de would determine the displacement amount from these two amounts and use that to calculate the weight of the loaded boat. This was compared with the weight of the boat when it was empty, which was taken from a list that was kept on file at the waylock. After the weight was determined, the chamber would be rewatered and a toll would be assessed so that the boat could leave the waylock. The system wasn't as accurate as the Canal Commission had hoped, so a new solution needed to be found. So the next waylock in Syracuse was built in 1828, and it used a new system for weighing boats. This was the first waylock to use a scale. When the water was drained from the chamber, the boat would come to rest on a cradle that would be attached to a scale. The weight was transferred to the scale by way of balance beams that held the cradle. The waylock was rebuilt in 1834, and it was made of stone and cement this time instead of wood. But at the time of the opening, it was becoming obsolete. The canal was to be enlarged, and along with it, the locks would also increase in size, which meant that larger boats could ply the canal. Uh, larger boats would put greater strain on the existing waylocks, including the one here in Syracuse. So problems with weighing larger boats in the 1834 waylock began pretty much immediately. And at the same time, the waylock just kept getting busier. So clearly, a new solution needed to be found. Work on a new waylock at a new location the junction of the Erie and Oswego canals began at the end of 1848. These are some photos that I took of this really great model that we have of the current waylock. It's on the first floor of the museum. It shows the wooden cradle and kind of how it was attached to the building. So the new waylock would also operate with a scale. The original scale in the 1850 waylock was made by Squire Whipple of Utica who was a noted contractor on the canal system who had also made the scale for the Utica Waylock. This first scale raised concerns about accuracy among boat owners and canal employees who noticed a lot of variability between weights reported at Syracuse and those reported at other waylocks. Some of this was likely due to carelessness of the scale operators. And as it turned out, the weight of boats on the enlarged canal was underestimated by the designers of the new waylocks, including the one in Syracuse. So the scales were replaced with those that could handle higher weights. The Whipple scale was designed to handle up to 400 tons, and that was sufficient for the first 10 years of its operation. But by the early 1860s, the scale was suffering breakages, and in May of 1861, a deal with the Fairbanks Scale Company was negotiated to replace the Whipple scale with one that could weigh up to 550 tons. The new scale was installed in July of 1861 and worked well, at first, anyway. By October of 1861, there were problems. There were breakages in the iron couplings on the rods that attached the scale to the wooden cradle. The wooden cradle itself was too short for larger boats on the enlarged canal, which could be up to 98 feet in length. So they ended up replacing the cradle in 1866, but the problems with the rods breaking continued and repairs were just kind of made as needed until toll collection was abolished after 1882. The bright spot here is that the scale was said to be as accurate as any on the canal. So at least there's that. Um, this photo is uh, one that I took of the scale that's on exhibit at the museum. This was the type that was used in the waylock. Use of the scale declined after toll collection ended, of course, and then the scale was removed altogether in 1906. And then, of course, the canal was closed, filled in, and paved over in Syracuse in the 1920s, as shown here. So now that we've learned more about the scales that determine tolls charged by the Syracuse waylock, let's take on the final question. There we go. So this question apparently comes up often during tours of the Erie Canal Museum because a few of our docents recommended that I address it in this talk. I think it's important to look at the significance that New York canals had for religious movements. Since this is intended to be a shorter take on this history, I thought it would be interesting to just look at a couple of these innovative religious movements that date to the 19th century Erie Canal. Any one of these topics could form a comprehensive curator talk all on its own. So if you're interested in learning more about this history, I recommend seeking out books. Um, of particular note is Jack Kelly's work that's entitled Heaven's Ditch, God, Gold, and Murder on the Erie Canal. So the Erie Canal's history is linked to the Second Great Awakening, which uh, was about 1790 to 1840. This movement saw the spread of religion through revivals and preaching and came hand in hand with social reform initiatives. 
Western New York and parts of Central New York comprised what became known as the Burned Over District due to the speed at which this religious wildfire spread over the area. A man named Charles Finney coined this term. Finney was a revivalist preacher and evangelist in Western New York in the early years of, years of the Erie Canal. He was also an advocate of ideas like abolitionism, which grew and spread because of the canal. He later went on to teach and preside over Oberlin College in Ohio, which is still today known as a bastion of liberal arts education. So here's a map showing uh, the areas of the Burned Over District. What you have to remember is that Western New York in particular was still a wild frontier in the early years of the Erie Canal, and it was ripe with possibilities for enterprising preachers to spread their ideas because established churches and clergy were rare in these areas. Uh, the Erie Canal offered an opportunity to truly Americanize religious faith. And it's interesting to me that while many of these movements came to life on the Erie Canal, they later ended up spreading elsewhere and they became more associated with the places they ended up. For example, you know, when you think about Mormonism, you tend to think American West. You don't think Western Erie Canal. The Erie Canal was a great pressure cooker for ideas, and it also brought a lot of people to parts of the country that were very rural and underdeveloped to this point. And even the fact that a canal could be constructed across New York, leading to points beyond, was taken to be a mark of divine providence. There's a natural pathway between the Catskill and Appalachian Mountains of the Mohawk River. This was a sign for 19th century Americans that their creator had provided the setting, the tools, the intelligence for such a project. If Americans could take the reins and create such a marvel, what was stopping them from creating their own better world in the here and now? So you can't really talk about the religious movements along the Erie Canal without talking about Joseph Smith and Mormonism. Joseph Smith was not a native New Yorker. He had been born in Vermont in 1805, and his family moved to Palmyra, New York, when he was about 10 years old. Smith's family was very spiritual, uh, with members who had visions and believed in miracles. Smith formally organized the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1830 in Western New York after claiming to have had visions of angels and to have been directed to a Bible of the Western continent, which he dug up and dictated to his wife and friends and had them write down what he read from these golden plates. So this, of course, became the Book of Mormon, which Smith had printed in an initial run of 5,000 copies. The press that he used to print this would, had actually arrived on a canal boat in 1830. Smith drew a lot of interested converts to his new faith, but persecution drove the new church from Western New York over to Ohio, and then to Missouri, Illinois, and finally on to Utah. Smith himself became a martyr for his faith. The largest groups of Mormon faithful today are found in the Western United States, but the church has over 16 million members worldwide. Not bad for a movement that started in New York's burned over district. The Oneida community was an, another uh, religious movement that sprung up because of the Erie Canal. This was a communal society that was founded in Oneida, New York by John Humphrey Noyes, yet another Vermonter. Noyes believed in Christian perfectionism. This is the notion that it was possible for a Christian to achieve a life free of sin in the here and now. In Noyes' case, he thought that by virtue of having given his will to God, all of his decisions would be moral and correct because they came from a perfect heart. Noyes began to act on his intuition, and as a result, he was expelled from the Yale Theological Seminary and his ministerial license was revoked. He began his new church in Vermont, but relocated to Oneida, New York after he was arrested for adultery and then released. The Oneida community was utopian in nature, and it was notable for its rather different attitudes toward relationships, marriage, and child rearing. They believed in biblical communism, which meant that all things would be shared among members, including children and spouses. Noyes coined the term free love long before hippies in the 1960s. <laughs> the Oneida community existed from 1848 to 1881, and they ended up creating the Oneida Limited Silverware Company after their commune dissolved. I'm a big fan of their work. I have it in my kitchen at home. And I want to talk just a little bit about the community of true inspiration because their initial location in the canal region didn't go as intended. This was a radical pietist group which broke away from denominational Lutheranism in order to focus on ethical purity, inward devotion, charity, asceticism, and mysticism. And incidentally, these are all qualities that a lot of these 19th century movements shared. The community consisted of German, Swiss, and Austrian immigrants who came to West Seneca, New York in Erie County. Uh, today, West Seneca is a suburb of Buffalo. The settlers migrated to the area as a group from Europe in the 1840s due to increasing persecution at home. Their colony was a commune and they had community held property and their settlers worked in textile production as well as farming. However, they were not happy about how crowded the area was becoming in this period. Remember, Buffalo's existence was spurred by the Erie Canal's western terminus being located there. 
And today, Buffalo is New York's second most populated city. It was a boom town in the mid 19th century. So a lot of the group members relocated to the Iowa River Valley in 1854 to found the Amana colonies. The group is actually still in existence and they were also best known for something you might find in your kitchen. Amana Refrigeration was originally founded as part of the, for, uh, part of the for-profit organization that the community formed during the Great Depression. Amana is part of the Whirlpool Corporation today. I hope this has been informative. I'm always looking for ways to fill in some of these gaps in knowledge about the Erie Canal. And it was really very enlightening to talk with my fellow staff members and our volunteers about the questions that come up a lot. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, this, this was very, a lot of fun to put together and uh, I'm gonna miss the Erie Canal Museum and the people that I work with and talking to our visitors and doing programs like this. But I'm, I'm intending to do programs like this for the St. Lawrence County Historical Association. So check us out. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Ashley. I'm going to go ahead and change it. You all are now able to unmute yourselves. Um, if you have any questions for Ashley, you are welcome to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask it, or you can also send us a message in the chat box and she will attempt to answer any questions you might have. Hey, who knows, maybe maybe ECM FAQ part two for, for the next curator. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Sure, Adam. Uh, when we get to the 200th anniversary of the completion of the Erie Canal in 2025, how will people celebrate the occasion? I hope they'll celebrate it more effectively than we've managed to this year. Unfortunately, the pandemic pretty well scuttled our big plans for Syracuse because, you know, 2020 was the big Syracuse yeah. year. And you know, I, I did my did my exhibit here at the museum, which if you guys haven't haven't seen, you need to come check it out. Um, it's going to be up. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have to take it down before I leave. So <laughs> come see it soon. Um, I I don't know, honestly, Natalie. Have you heard anything? Is the Canal Corp on top of this? I sure hope they are. I I don't know of any specifics yet. It's a very good question. Um, I think I think the Canal Corp is on top of it. I know that in 2000, 2017, I wouldn't say 2017 snuck up on them, but there was a big transition that happened with the Canal Corp in 2017. Um, and so I, I think that they have been working since then to plan for 2025. Um, so I, I don't know any specifics, Adam. It's a very good question. Uh, but I, I, I think there will be celebrations. I am hoping that we do some sort of noise making all along the banks of the canal. If they figured out how to make noise across the state in 1825, we can figure it out in 2025. Maybe we don't use real cannons, but cannons, no. <laughs> don't need to. There's so many other things that make noise now as loud as cannons. Um, so I don't know yet, but I, I promise as we as we find out what plans are, we'll make sure that that our community knows. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh pandemic man Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> anybody else all right well um i have a question sure. the uh erie canal you made a point served as a conduit for transmutation of ideas um is that also similar to other transportation ways i'm thinking of the mississippi river or the uh the wagon train trails out west is that or is that phenomenon of religious ideas unique to the erie canal oh i doubt it's unique to the erie canal but the thing about the erie canal though is that it's a shorter distance than either of those i mean everything was sort of compact you know 363 miles across one state spreading out to this sort of undiscovered undeveloped west um, and just the, the the amount of traffic on the canal and the way that cities grew so fast. I think it was it was that, but it was supercharged. Okay, that's that's an interesting point that it really was a lot that happened in a very short amount of time in a very short space. Yeah, like it's it's a big space in context of like 1825 when when Move, like when Rochester was the West, like that is, a, it was a large area, but in actuality, it was a relatively small area. Um, I do think it's a, a good point to, to, that Ashley made that, that many of the religious movements that were born along the, the canal did end up moving West um, and probably utilized some of those, those transportation routes um, to do so. So um, I don't, I, I, I'm not, 
an expert in, uh, in, in, in those areas, but, but I imagine that that fervor follows people. And so as people moved west, religious fervor probably did as well. Anybody else? Yeah. All right, well, thank you guys very much. Um, take care, be safe out there. If you haven't been to the museum lately, we have reopened, uh, we require reservations, but we're, we're fairly quiet most days and generally we can fit you in. So come, come check out our stuff. <laughs> Come by and pay us a visit and uh, stay tuned for, for more programming, both in person and virtually. Um, Ashley mentioned her uh, bicentennial exhibit that will be available virtually soon as well. So if you're not able to come see it in person, we will have a, a virtual version of it, um, both led by Ashley and uh, also just the PDF of the, the panels um, that you can, you can read as well. So um, stay tuned for that as well. Thank you guys so much and uh, have a great rest of your week. All right, thank you guys.